meeting to order. It is, uh, this meeting is, uh, is a full committee uh, markup. It's a pr procedural uh, meeting having to do with the resolution of inquiry that has been filed and the uh, need for, uh, for a decision on the part of this committee. And so uh, with that, uh, let me uh, It has been, uh, the, the resolution has been properly noticed and circulated electronically along with copies of timely filed amendments and with no, uh, and will be available on the committee repository at docs, uh, dot house dot gov. Uh, late amendments will also be circulated uh, electronically. Pursuant to uh, the committee rules, members of the committee may submit written opening statements for the record. I ask members that members may revise and extend the remarks and the measure to be considered at the markup and have, and have those remarks included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Pursuant to committee rule three I and the house rule 11 clause two, I announce that I may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment on which a, rec a recorded vote or the nays and yeas have, are ordered. Uh, documents, amendments, and, or motions must be submitted to hnrc.docs email from a house maintained email address. Um, so uh, please, uh, we, please note that members are responsible for their own microphones and members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent backgrounds. Uh, Members, if any member experiences technical problems, uh, they should inform the committee staff immediately. And before uh, beginning uh, on the resolution, let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Westerman, for an opening statement. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as we all know, global demand for minerals is skyrocketing with no end in sight. Everything from our cell phones to x-ray machines to electric vehicles would be inoperable without minerals not to mention the fact that minerals such as copper are the cornerstone of a clean energy future. Copper is a key part of this equation. In the last 5,000 years, mankind has mined 550 metric tons of copper. Let me repeat that, 5,000 years and 550 metric tons. Now, scientists estimate that the world will need to mine the same amount, the same amount that we've mined in 5,000 years, we will need to mine that in the next 25 years alone to meet the global demand. With these facts in mind, you'd think that we would have members of both parties taking every opportunity to boost American copper mining and exploration since our rigorous environmental standards lead the world. But the opposite is true. Democrats on this committee and across the Biden administration have attacked domestic mineral production over and over and over again. With the net effect, of boosting China's mineral stranglehold on the world. I understand the idea of not in my backyard, uh, but we have to have a little bit of reality in the equation. There are people who don't like agriculture, but without agriculture, we don't eat. There are people who don't like oil and gas exploration, but without oil and gas, we cannot meet our energy demands. And there are people who don't like mining, uh, there are people who don't like logging, but you know what? Without logging, we don't have toilet paper. Without mining, we don't have the electronics and the clean energy future that we're looking forward to. We can do it better in America than anywhere else, uh, but we have to get past this not in my backyard mentality. The Resolution Copper Mine in Mr. Gosar's district has been in the permitting process for years. It would revitalize the state's economy and meet up to a quarter of our U.S. demands for copper uh, for the next 40 years. Supporting this domestic mining project should be a no-brainer, yet the Biden administration has rescinded the mines permit and kept these valuable American minerals under lock and key. And I'll remind everyone that this project was done by a bipartisan agreement between Senator McCain and Senator Reid. Uh, Mr. Gosar's resolution of inquiry would provide an opportunity for oversight into this administration's unilateral decision, uh, something that's been severely lacking under the uh, committee's uh, 
current operation. After all, without thorough congressional oversight, federal agencies essentially remain a black box, shutting off the American taxpayer from having any insight to the decisions that impact their daily lives. This administration's status quo has been to delay and stall. They've halted energy leases, slow walked permitting, fired American workers, and driven out our industries to overseas competitors. We need answers. Earlier this year, several of my colleagues and I filed other resolutions of inquiry that would provide more essential transparency into federal agencies, pulling back the curtain to see how they were spending taxpayer funds and implementing programs. Committee Democrats unilaterally voted against every single one. Oversight is not a partisan issue, or at least it shouldn't be. All we're asking for are documents and materials that already exist so that we can ensure the Biden administration is complying with the law and congressional intent. Without this oversight, questions remain unanswered and federal agencies remain unaccountable to the American taxpayer. No party, agency, or federal official is above the law. It's time for this committee to do its job and get some answers. My colleagues can start today by voting favorably uh, to report uh, this resolution of inquiry from the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding this markup and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Westerman. And uh, let me recognize myself. Uh, we're here today to consider another Republican resolution of inquiry, ROI. And as my colleagues know, ROIs are non-binding information requests from the House to the executive. In this case, documents regarding the proposed resolution copper mine in, uh, in Arizona. I asked my colleagues to join me in opposing this resolution. And I said as our previous ROI markup, I agree that every administration should take seriously all legitimate congressional requests for documents and factual information, including by providing relevant materials as quickly and as fully as possible. Fortunately, the Biden administration has been far more transparent and by the book than its predecessor. Here, there are no procedural irregularities or instances of obstruction that would justify the entire House of Representatives to demand a fishing expedition of documents from the White House and the Department of Agriculture. The administration has been and continues to be responsive to congressional requests and to following proper procedures. The resolution copper mine requires a, complete, a completed environmental impact statement, which the Biden administration is working to finalize using proper procedures, sound science, and public input. Without credible evidence that there's something worth investigating here, this resolution is unwarranted. I suspect my colleagues know that this and that the, resolu that the resolution is more than relitigating a matter we have already addressed. The committee has extensively debated the issue, the issue in this Congress. We held a hearing on my bill, the Save, Save the Oak Flat, which would repeal a proposed land exchange uh, for the mine. We then considered the bill at two very lengthy and contentious markups. In my view, there is no reason to relitigate business that we've already settled at two prior markups this Congress. And for that reason, I'll be brief in repeating my argument. The mine's proposed location will devastate a major religious site that is sacred to multiple tribal communities in Arizona. This area deserves protection, period. I am appreciative of the administration's robust approach to the EIS process and that has incorporated tribal input, finally. My Republican colleagues have already expressed their support for the mine and their opposition to the Save Oak Flat at, at length. It is my hope that we can move, move things quick, quickly along today. And with that, I call up the resolution. The item for consideration is House Resolution 1378, offered by Representative Gosar. With, without objection, the resolution will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Does any member wish to be recognized on the resolution at this point? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Westman, sir, you're recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do support this resolution of inquiry sponsored by Congressman Gosar, and I wish Congressman Gosar would have been able to uh, participate in the committee hearing today to discuss his, his resolution. HRS 1378 would secure needed information from the Biden administration about why it reversed earlier agency decisions and delayed the development of an extremely promising copper mine. Specifically, the resolution before us today requests all documents and communications from the Department of Agriculture regarding the Resolution Copper Mine near Superior, Arizona. The Biden administration's deeply misguided administrative actions with respect to this and other domestic minerals projects flies in the face of the growing need for responsible domestic mining to reduce our dependence on foreign minerals and support our economy. The Resolution Copper Project would provide $1 billion in economic activity annually to the state of Arizona. Between $88 million and $113 million in state and local tax revenue and $200 million in federal tax revenue. Additionally, the mine could provide up to a quarter of, a na of the national copper demand, as I mentioned earlier, which is an incredibly important factor to consider. Uh, since the World Bank has estimated that global copper man could double in just the next few decades. Bipartisan support for this project goes back years, making the Biden administration's decision to abruptly reverse course even more striking. A land exchange to facilitate the project was signed into a law by President Obama as part of the fiscal year 2015 National Defense Authorization Act. Seven years of environmental review and tribal consultation followed. In addition to the pre-consultation work that had begun in 2003, on January 15, 2021, the Trump administration published a roughly 3,000-page Final Environmental Impact Statement, or FEIS, and a record of decision on the project. Unfortunately, less than a month later, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, or ACHP, terminated the consultation process under the National Historical Preservation Act, directly contradicting its earlier acknowledgments that both the Tonto National Forest and Resolution Copper complied with their consultation requirements. In fact, the ACHP had previously stated that it was, quote, supportive of the substantive, substantive revisions that the programmatic agreement had undergone to, quote, improve its clarity and functionality. As a result of ACHP's termination decision, the Biden administration rescinded the FEIS and record of decision just two months after the documents were first issued. Unfortunately, we have seen the Biden administration's hostility towards safe, responsible domestic mining play out across the country, including the Department of Agriculture's attempt to withdraw nearly 240,000 acres of federal land from mineral development in the Duluth complex of Minnesota. This is why we must have all the information regarding how, when, and by whom decisions about the Resolution Copper Project were made. On November 3rd, 2022, House Committee Agriculture Ranking Member Thompson joined me in a letter to Secretary Vilsack regarding instances of administrative overreach, including the concern that a fair scientific process had not been followed for the Resolution Copper Project. Domestic mining and our national mineral security should not be threatened by changing political whims. And the resolution we are considering today reiterates the need for clarity from the Biden administration on this, important, on this very important topic. I support favorably reporting H Resolution 1378, and I yield back. Gentlemen, anyone else wish to be recognized? Mr. Graves, sir? Gentlemen, must recognize? Oh, Mr. McClintock, excuse me. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I simply want to implore you and, and your Democratic colleagues to reconsider the policies that you've been pursuing. Uh, on the one hand, you want to mandate not only electric cars, but industrial scale backup batteries for wind and solar farms, all in the name of saving the planet. Yet on the other hand, you want to radically restrict mining, also in the name of saving the planet. Well, you can't do both. You, you've been moderately successful at, at mandating electric cars. Uh, the California bureaucrats have just imposed such a mandate on Californians over the next decade. About 3% of vehicle sales are now electric, so congratulations, only 97% more to go. 
And we don't need to get into a discussion today about where you think the electricity for your electric cars is going to come from. About 80% of our electricity still comes from the very fossil fuels that you're waging war against, and you're creating devastating shortages by doing that. We'll, we'll save that for another day. But let's just look at the mining requirements. In order to meet your electric car mandates, specifically a six-fold increase in demand over the next decade, we're going to need 384 additional graphite, lithium, nickel, and cobalt mines by 2035, according to industry forecasts. Expensive recycling mandates will only reduce this number to 336 new mines that we're going to need. In fact, according to the uh, International Energy Agency, an electric car requires six times the mineral inputs of a comparable internal combustion vehicle, six times the mining to produce a comparable car. And of course, copper is a critical component in this technology, and copper is what you're trying to shut down in the matter before us today. If it is your contention that the mining required to produce electric cars is a threat to the environment, then you are also admitting that the electric cars that require it are a threat to the environment. Can't you see how foolish and self-destructive and absurdly contradictory these policies have become? And can't you see yet the damage that you're doing not only to the environment but to people's lives? As you make it harder and harder to mine the components to meet your mandates, the expense of those materials rises dramatically. We're already seeing that at the gas pump and in our utility bills, and it's not just electricity, it's everything these minerals could be used for if they were more efficiently applied. When something is scarce, it becomes expensive. You're making all of the things that we depend upon for our quality of life more scarce and therefore more expensive. You're fixated on, on a one degree rise of global temperatures over the next century, but you couldn't care less that you're making it financially impossible for many people to heat their homes in sub-freezing winters. Europe's now reverting to burning wood to survive this winter. This is not going to end well for humanity, and it's not going to end well for your party as more and more people connect the dots between your policies and the conditions that they're now suffering. You need to stop this. The resolution before us will at least shed some light on the inexplicably absurd decision that your administration made to unilaterally thwart a bipartisan legislative act and to impede one of the most important copper mines in America. And, and frankly, you need this information more than we do because maybe it will dissuade you from continuing with the childish fantasies and the self-destructive policies that you are going to be held accountable for both by voters and by history. I yield back. I just uh, remind my friend that ac accountability in Congress, having been on both sides of that question, the minority and the majority, accountability happens instantly. And, uh, and that's the way it should be. And uh, if indeed that instance comes, where um, your points are the preeminent points, then uh, we'll get to that point. But right now, uh, we serve with all due respect. Uh, our effort has been to deal with the overwhelming issue of climate. And all the components under our jurisdiction have been directed at making that part of every equation. And to us, it is not just a real threat, it is a factual and scientific threat based on that. And we need to do something about it. That, that perspective is not going to change. Uh, and, and where there is uh, middle ground, equitable middle ground, to talk about some of these important yeah, Mr. issues, Chairman, I Mr. think Chairman, we should. I, I believe I recognize you're, myself, well, I think you're speaking on my time. Let me yield back. So I, 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 I will reclaim it and just point out that you're doing no good for the environment or the quality of life of the American people. We just, you, you've made it impossible for us to harvest excess timber so that it's now burning in our forests. We just got a university uh, study indicating that all of the carbon dioxide restrictions at enormous expense to the people of California uh, from 2003 to 2021 have now been exceeded by one mm -hmm. year's 
carbon emissions from uh, from the 2021 forest fires. So now, let me I'll, reclaim my again. time. Uh, uh, you can reclaim my Gentlemen, time. I, I yield the rest of my time. Well, I think you were on borrowed time, Mr. McClintock. Uh, but uh, thank you. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Mr. Chair. Sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I uh, start my comments, you had uh, st uh, just stated that uh, you need factual and scientific uh, uh, basis uh, for, for a project. You can get the facts, the science, and the truth by going forward with an environmental impact statement um, such as we're requesting in the Duluth complex. Uh, this administration and uh, this majority, current majority in the Natural Resources Committee won't allow an environmental impact statement to go forward. I rise today in the name of transparency, good governance, and good faith in support of my colleague's resolution of inquiry to the U.S. Forest Service regarding the Resolution Copper Project. This is the House Natural Resources Committee where we have jurisdiction over mining projects on federal land like Resolution Copper. Republicans have consistently supported fixing our supply chain deficiencies by offering concrete proposals to onshore our minerals, supporting good paying jobs, revitalizing communities, and letting America control its own destiny. Some Democrats on this panel who are nearing their, their end in the majority have lightly acknowledged that they may support some sort of mining for their electric vehicle or wind and solar goals. But when asked what mining projects they would actually support, they can't or won't name a single project. It's truly nimbyism at its finest. Democrats voted for billions and billions in spending on the so-called transition away from traditional fuels all while, all while refusing to support any domestic feedstock. And the Biden administration is no different. Resolution Copper's land exchange was signed into law in a 2014 NDAA. It just needed the final environmental impact statement completed. The Trump administration rightfully published the FEIS and the project was moving forward. However, Joe Biden opted to reverse this FEIS and halt yet another domestic mining project. And Democrats ignore local community pleas for mining. The International Brotherhood of Boilermakers, Iron Shipbuilders, Blacksmiths, Blacksmiths, Forgers, and Helpers Lodge 627 in Phoenix overwhelmingly oppose the Biden administration's decision to revoke the FEIS. From business manager Jacob Evanson, and I quote, Every time decisions like this are made by DC bureaucrats, our boilermakers are out of a job. The USDA's decision means our members, most of which are Navajo and Apache tribal members, will continue to hope and wait for the day when they can clothe their families, feed their parents, and put shoes on little feet. I'd like to enter Mr. Evanson's letter into the record. Sadly, this is in line with the Biden administration's policy since day one. In October of 2020, during the campaign, Joe Biden pledged to use domestic miners for its energy goals, but immediately turned his back when he became president. In fact, the Commerce Department is now defining Canadian minerals as, quote, domestic. You just can't make it up. What do Canadian miners have that American miners don't? Do Canadians measure environmental impacts better? Are the families of Canadian mi miners more worthy to receive a reliable paycheck than American miners? If we report this uh, ROI favorably, we'll at least get a chance to see what this administration is thinking. Maybe we'll see who pressures Secretary Vilsack into turning his back on American workers, like business manager Jacob Evanson from Phoenix. And to my Democratic colleagues, it's time to start acknowledging that we need domestic mining. If you actually cared about the energy transition or lower emissions in the transportation sector, you'd support some of these mining projects. Now is an opportunity to stop just paying lip service. You can vote today against unfavorably reporting the ROI and start on the pathway from nimbyism and towards putting your money where your mouth is on the transition. Next, Congress there will be a Republican representing all of the Resolution Copper Project as Eli Crane just won that seat in Arizona. 
I imagine Mr. Crane would agree with my position here. Do right by Mr. Crane, do right by workers in Arizona, do right by American miners, and do right by your pledge to lower emissions. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Graves, you said to be recognized. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to engage in a colloquy with the ranking member for just a minute. Uh, ranking member Westerman, if, if, this, if this resolution were to come up in, in six weeks or so when you have the gavel, would this pass the House? Would this pass the committee? Uh, I would strongly support it passing the committee. And, and you're going to have a majority of members on your side, and you expect that it would pass? I would hope so. Okay. Don't want to so, be presumptuous. All right. So one, I, I think... I'll be presumptuous. This is going to pass the next Congress. Number two, if this were to pass, would this do anything other than just provide information to the committee? Oh, that's all it's uh, doing is trying to get information from the administration. And I would hope to be able to use tools like this and every tool at our disposal to get more information from this administration and to invite uh, administration officials over to the committee to, to visit with us about their decisions. Thank you. And, and last question, ranking member. Um, if, if, if this were to pass, would this cause any forcing factor on the agency in terms of their decision to approve, not approve? Is, does it have any impact along those lines? No, it's just asking for uh, information. It's providing transparency and oversight like we're supposed to do in Congress. Thank you very much. I appreciate you clarifying that. So, so Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to be clear on what this does. This is just asking for information so the committee can understand what's happening in regard to, to this mining decision. Um, Mr. Chairman, we've sat here for the last year and a half or so, and we've watched as this administration has aggressively tried to transform energy policy and energy markets in the United States. And let's remind you of the outcome. The outcome has been that Americans uh, today, one in every four Americans are having to choose among food, medicine, or energy cost, which means utility and, and refueling their vehicles. One in every four Americans. So, so number one, this administration's energy policies are forcing people into energy poverty. Number two, we are now going to countries like Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, uh, Iran, and others and asking them for energy because we're refusing to produce it. This administration has tapped more energy out of our strategic reserves, our emergency reserves, than every other president in American history combined, putting us in a dangerous, vulnerable situation to what's happening globally in regard to energy markets, energy volatility, Russia, and others. Number three, and, and something that I, I, I can't emphasize enough, emissions have gone up, not down. Emissions have gone up under this administration, not down. They were going down during the previous administration. They're going up under this administration. So you're failing on every single metric. So now what's happened is we've watched this, this administration under the IIJA, the ARA, the, um, the IRA, and other um, imaginary or, 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 or um, I guess, deceiving titles of legislation, this administration has set aside $610 billion, billion dollars in taxpayer funds to force this energy market in different directions. And if you look at science and data to actually guide decisions, you would recognize that if we're going to meet any of these goals, including net zero by 2050, then you're going to have to double, you're going to have to double copper production by 2035. Double it. Now, I remind you, in the IRA, you provided tax incentives or a tax subsidy when people buy electric vehicles, but you have a domestic content requirement. Right now, 40% of all copper is refined or processed in China. 40%. We're, we're importing, I believe it's 45%. I think last year was the latest statistic. I think 45% of all copper minerals. So th there is no plan. There's no strategy. It's all disjointed. And that $610 billion, that's going to end up going to other countries. It's going to end up going to other countries. And I remind you, Mr. Chairman, other countries like China, 
They don't care about the environment. They don't care about labor standards as, as, as Mr. Stauber has led efforts in this Congress. China uses child labor, they use slave labor, and they trash the environment. We, we can't just go out there and wish or hope that things are going to happen and say, well, we wish everybody buys these cars. We wish that everybody uses, you know, unicorns to power their house or whatever. But you've got to have a strategy behind it. And saying no to everything isn't a strategy. It actually puts America in jeopardy. It makes this more dangerous. So, Mr. Chairman, in closing, I remind you, this resolution simply asks for information from the agencies so this committee can make an informed decision. This is only about transparency. I urge adoption of the resolution. I want to thank Mr. Gosar and yield back. Gentleman yields. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Sir, Mr. Tiffany. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would um, just pose a question. So resolution copper could provide up to 25% of our domestic demand. Um, do you have projects that you support that can replace that? The gentleman's been recognized. Uh, with all due respect, I'm not going to go through a Q&A with you. I'll treat it as a rhetorical question. No, it's fair enough, Mr. Chairman. Um, but that's the question that's out here. And we were asking this a couple months ago. What projects do you support? Um, oh, we can't support this one. Every single time a project comes up, there is some reason why it cannot be done. And it's becoming the question, what projects do you support? You've got to start telling the American people what projects you're going to support in regards to this, because otherwise you've just become more dependent on the rest of the world, including bad actors that are out there. America has went in a wrong direction since January 20th of 2021, and it was very clear to the world if people did not believe candidate Biden's words in 2020, they certainly saw it immediately on January 20th of 2021 when the Keystone Pipeline was shut down. The pipeline of sending people up from Panama to America was opened up the exact opposite of what the American people had hoped for. It was followed up by removing sanctions on the Nord Stream line, uh, sending the message to the Germans, hey, you're gonna be just okay. As um, I think the, my colleague from California stated, um, and I'll put a finer point on it, I think it was just a couple months ago, the number one search over in Germany was how to cut firewood. Think about it, number one search uh, going into search engines is how are we gonna cut firewood? as a result of the Germans' dependence on the Russians, which they were warned about. Then we go to the disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan, once again showing American weakness. And then let's just go to the Midwest here, uh, where my colleague just to my left here and where we reside. We had blackout threats for the first time in the state of Wisconsin. Our regional grid operator, no partisan organization that is, they came out for the very first time and said that you are under threat of blackouts in Wisconsin. Why? Because we've went to intermittent sources of power. And now we have the Namaji Trail project. I urge you to search uh, for that project that is proposed for Superior, Wisconsin, that's going to use clean burning, affordable, reliable natural gas to produce electricity to make sure that the lights can be on 24 hours a day as some of the major utilities continue this push to having intermittent sources of power. And then, of course, we have Line 5 that runs across from the twin ports of Superior and Duluth, um, all the way across northern Wisconsin, northern Michigan. And you have a governor over in Michigan who wants to shut down Line 5 and stop a rebuilding of that line, which would make it much safer through the Mackinac Straits. Weakness, dependence on others, you don't think the Chinese are, are not watching this? They see this decline of America. And that really is the question before all of us at this point. Is the 20, we all know the 20th century was an American century. The greatness of America, the greatness of the ideas that were uh, put in place at the founding led to the tremendous prosperity in this country. But the question is now in the 21st century, who is um, whose century is this going to be? With the decline of America, especially the rapid decline over the last year and a half, with an administration that wants to make us more dependent on um, other countries around the world, that goes over and begs the Saudis for oil, it's clear the direction that we're going in. 
President Xi sees that weakness as he gets his unprecedented third term, as he has squelched freedom in Hong Kong, as he's going after the Taiwanese, as he has um, continued to produce products that we consume in America, including those uh, wind turbines and solar panels with slave labor in Western China, President Xi sees our weakness. When are we going to stop? When are we going to stop and reassess this transition to taking America to a terrible place that is not going to benefit all Americans. All we're asking here is a little bit of transparency, a little bit of accountability. Let's get the information before us of what has happened and the purpose of this ROI. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields. Uh I would disagree with the gentleman. I don't think the country started going bad after January 20th. It started to go bad uh, after uh, January 6th. And, uh, and I think the American people collectively have given us a pause. And uh, I hope we take advantage of Will the side. gentleman yield? I, I was actually uh, taking a privilege, but I will yield a small part of the privilege because I was going to move on to see who else wanted to talk about uh, the resolution. Yeah, I would only ask two things in regards to January 6th. Why are Nancy uh, Speaker Pelosi's records not available oh. to the committee that were on her communications on January 6th? Why was the minority not allowed to be able to name their members to it? And by the way, why is there not a full review of the riots of the Summer of Love of 2020? If we're going to do a comprehensive review, let's do a comprehensive review. The American people are just, fair minded. Okay, minded. reclaiming my time. I, Mr. Tiffany, we're just going to have to agree to the fact that uh, I don't follow the same uh, social media outlets that you do. Uh, and so uh, I, don't have, I don't have privy to your information. And more importantly, uh, I'm not sure I'd want to follow that social media uh, angle. I, I, we just disagree. I think it's a philosophical disagreement. Factually, that's another issue that uh, if the facts aren't going to rule, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, just ask Speaker Pelosi one question. Why will she not share her communications from January 5th and 6th with the committee? I'll ask that, that question if you will ask some of your colleagues uh, to waiver their privilege and turn over phone records and other communications uh, dealing with uh, January 6th, sitting colleagues in this uh, building. If, if you would do that and go specifically and they respond positively, I, I think it's a fair question and I'll get an answer. But we have to do both. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Mr. Chairman. Sir, you're recognized. For Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to also add support in the effort uh, to proceed with HRS 1378. This is not a unique situation, and there's some parallels that exist in a project of my home state of Idaho. There's a critical source for copper that this resolution addresses for a critical need. In my home state of Idaho, we submitted a plan under a, a project called Midas Gold 2016. Significant resources of gold, silver, tungsten, and antimony. You may recall antimony is on the critical mineral list. Necessary for munitions, batteries, solar panels, the things that we need to try to achieve some of the, the, uh, the green energy initiatives, got to have antimony. 90% of the current supply for that comes from Russia, China, and Tajikistan. Right now, with the hurdles in front, maybe, Maybe 2027. Maybe. 
So the struggle with that H1378 is attempting to address is not strictly unique. It's been said in so many ways what the need is and what the current solutions are and they just simply don't line up. You know what, God gave us the resources we need and also the mind to manage it wisely. We're failing on the latter part. As has been stated, the only thing that H. Res 1378 does is simply request information. Transparency. There is no downside to that. Or is there? Maybe if you have the wrong agenda. There's no downside if the agenda is legitimate objective and we're trying to do the right thing for the American people. Mr. Chairman, I urge passage and consideration for HRS 1378. Yield back my time. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The gentleman yields. Anyone else? Ah, Mr. Gomer, you, uh, you, you recognize, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that. And actually, I agree with uh, the chairman that uh, we've been going downhill since January 6th. Uh, we've had federal judges who have ignored the Constitution. We've had Department of Justice that has taken on Gestapo tactics, and I don't say that lightly. I say it as after having studied Gestapo tactics, they are now in America. It's gotten so bad that as corrupt as China and Russia's justice systems are, they are now able to point to the United States with impunity uh, about all of the uh, political prisoners. We got federal judges that have gone 180 days without uh, ruling on you know, a habeas corpus when you know most people consider 180 days to be a reasonable time to get to trial on a criminal case, uh, the abuses have just been extraordinary. And so I agree with the chairman, the United States has gone down in the eyes of the world ever since January 6th, as they've seen the Gestapo tactics, the uh, abuses of civil rights in prison. Uh, they can point to those and say, well, I mean, we've gotten rid of our gulags, but now America as one right in the District of Columbia. So, but moving on to uh, 1378, I have such great respect for my Republican colleagues, but they've been really negative about uh, the policies of this administration and the damage that's been done to our economy, especially to the poor, the working poor, the people that are struggling to pay their energy bills, so I would like to look for the silver lining, and there is one. Uh, because we are not, because the cancellation of this project and the failure, the refusal to, as we just stated, use the gifts that God has gave us, we have been blessed with more natural resources of all kinds than any nation in the world, even though there are those that are bigger geographically than we are. Um, but on the bright side, uh, you know, this it's been going on for a while, but with the value of copper, that construction sites would put out the copper plumbing and have that ready for pouring concrete on the following days. Uh, the construction industry has had to increase their number of employees. So that's a great thing. Uh, but they're mainly for security guards to stay 24 seven at construction sites, even after concrete is poured because of the Democrats policy, the value has continued to get higher and higher. And so they're not going to the banks, they're going to construction sites. They're going to buildings that are already on the way up, not just uh, waiting for foundations. They're ripping copper out wherever they can get it. 
copper wiring, copper pipes. Uh, so they have created a, a bigger industry than ever in the theft of copper and uh, the resale market of copper uh, through the black market. So there are jobs being created by the Democrats' policies. And also, I don't think we should uh, belittle the fact that there are thousands and thousands of jobs being created in the energy sector to produce power. Unfortunately, they're in China, uh, as China is adding hundreds of coal-fired power plants all over the country and expects to continue adding those in the next two years. Now, in East Texas, we've got still got a couple of coal-powered plants left. They meet the requirements of the federal law. They have scrubbers on them to take out particulate before it gets into the air. So that in Texas, uh, for years now, our uh, air quality has continued to get better and better. Uh, unfortunately, we've had coal plants that have already been shut down. And to use the term of one of my uh, Republican colleagues, go, as we've gone to more intermittent power sources, solar and wind. Unfortunately, during some of our biggest storms, the, uh, Mr. Gomer, if uh, you could wrap up, up, if uh, oh, okay. you please. So anyway, thanks to the administration for the thousands and thousands of jobs they've created in China. Hopefully someday we can get some of okay. that back. Okay, gentleman so yields back. Uh, for, you know, and my colleagues on, on this side of the aisle, gentlemen, uh, you know, we're pretty tough skinned. Uh, but I don't know, this last accusation is maybe a little bit over the top. Uh, called a lot of things, but never a copper thief, you know? And I don't know, that's probably the low of the lows there. Uh, Sir, I never called you a <laughs> copper thief at all. The gentleman yields. Uh, who, Mr. Rosenthal, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, here we are on the Natural Resource Committee, and we are spending time talking about uh, an event that uh, another committee is dealing with on January 6th and we're talking about domestic cats, and yet the things that are causing problems across our country for our constituents, the high cost of energy, the high cost of groceries, uh, that we actually can do something about in this committee, and we're doing nothing about them. And it's very disappointing to me. And I was hoping that maybe in these final two months that we could actually address those. And one of the things that we are charged with here in Congress, as you said earlier, you're not privy to that information. And, and none of us, unfortunately, are privy to the information that we're trying to get on the resolution compromise. And that is all that this body and this resolution, 1378, that Representative Gosar has submitted, is trying to accomplish. It's not trying to pass any legislation. It's not trying to delay any legislation. It's trying to help this body to simply look at information so that we can see what is going on that is keeping this project from moving forward. You know, we, we, if we didn't learn anything during the pandemic, what we should have learned, all of us, is that we cannot be dependent upon foreign governments foreign adversaries to produce products for us, whether that's our medical supplies, our energy supplies, or anything else. And, and we find ourselves in that very spot because of the inability for us to produce domestically the things that we need. And unfortunately, those decisions are being made right in this committee. If we look at why we are right now in an investment of $70 billion, $70 billion that had been sent to Ukraine that we have not even received an accounting of to know where the money was spent, the reason that that has taken place and transpired is because of all of the decisions that were made by the Biden administration leading up to the invasion 
of Russia into Ukraine. On the very first day that he took office, an executive order to rescind the permit of the Keystone XL pipeline that would have brought 850,000 barrels a day of crude oil from our, one of our greatest allies, Canada, of which 150,000 barrels a day would have been Montana and North Dakota crude oil. That one decision not only eliminated all that energy from our country, but it eliminated 60 to $80 million a year from the tax revenue of, of Montana, going through some of the poorest counties in the state, in the state, which would have funded schools, it would have funded hospitals, it would have funded roadways, went out the window. And that was a sign of weakness that people around the world and our adversaries noticed, they took notice of. And then the sanctions were lifted from Nord Stream 2 to empower Russia, to sell their energy, to fuel, to fund their military machine. That was another big mistake. We saw the just failed, failed withdrawal from Afghanistan. Another big mistake. When you continue to show signs of weakness, it empowers our adversaries. It does not go unnoticed. And that is why we are dealing with that problem right now. And all this committee is asking is to start turning back and making decisions that show that we strengthen our own national security, that we recognize we are going to take control of these things. And instead of empowering these people across the globe, we want to keep it right here domestically. And all this resolution does is say, give us the information, shine a light on the transactions and the communications that were taking place. With that, I will absolutely support this resolution and I hope that my colleagues will do the same. I yield back. Gentleman yields, anyone else? Sir, recognized? Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to add, and I won't belabor a lot of things, I just want to add one really important point. I, I think we're at a very important point of our country right now with an opportunity to, to look forward and and I believe accomplish what the majority of us want to accomplish. We want to be able to embrace more renewable technology and doing so is going to require more American trust and trust in the American resources and trust in American industry. I, I support this, this resolution of inquiry. Um, I believe it will bring much needed transparency to the Biden administration's misguided um, decision to shut down the resolution copper project. Um, the Keystone pipeline was mentioned. You've got the Duluth in, in Minnesota. Um, this is this is something that I've that, that that's a, been a huge eye opener for me as I've served in this role. I was not in the mining industry in, in any way, shape, or form prior to to my time in Congress, and and as I was going out to to, to meet folks in my district, um, like every single meeting that I had, the first people they put me in touch with was their environmental team. Every single time I went out um, to any, and it particularly is in the eastern part of my state. And I was really coming into this bold and confident about how much effort they were putting into making sure that they weren't only just adhering to standards, but they were exceeding them. So they stayed on top of this issue. And, and I just have a, 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 a perspective on how important it is for us as lawmakers to trust them and to hold them accountable, but to continue to trust them. But to just arbitrarily use an executive order to just sort of cancel all this kind of stuff. Some of the data I have here, that between 2020 and 2021, our nation's copper reliance on foreign sources increased from 37 to 45%. That's 8% that we have to put too much trust into China. And I want to put that back into America. That's the, that, that, that is the message. That is what I'm fighting for. Um, the bill that I have on uh, energy production transparency, it doesn't say we need, we need to cut, we need to change anything with our environmental reviews. It actually says once the environmental reviews are done, we just need transparency to know what is going on with the permitting and leasing uh, um, regulation that, 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 that exists. Um, and, 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 I, and, and, and I'm gonna continue to, to, to work towards that. Uh, we've got our power company in Utah. I just had him come out and speak to a bipartisan group of people on the work that they're doing to build and continue to, to, to increase their portfolio with renewables. And they're at a point where with the NEPA that exists right now and the NEPA regulations, they're not able to even to, 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 to 
to truly take advantage of all of the additional um, renewable capabilities that we do have. This is something we've got to fix. The land exchange um, required for this project, the Resolution Copper Project, was, was given a green light by Congress and the previous administration as a critically important step in enhancing our nation's mineral supply. And if we are interested, truly interested, in pursuing green energy goals for any kinds, we, we have to have copper. It's a key ingredient um, for solar, thermal, winds, everything. And, and, and we're, uh, we, need to, we, we need to build that and trust ourselves before, before allowing any of that to be ceded to, to, our, for, to our adversaries. Um, instead of reporting this resolution unfavorably, I urge my colleagues to support HRES 1378, and I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Gentlemen, yields, anyone else? So, recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be, I'll be brief, but I do want to echo what my colleague from Utah just said, and I think part of the dialogue we're not really having, we're talking about green energy and those types of things, but in New Mexico, we have two national labs and a very large Department of Defense footprint, and after visiting and touring them, I think one of the elements we're also not discussing enough is the national defense piece on this, um, and this is so vital in terms of development and manufacturing for uh, critical defense infrastructure and weaponry. And I, I love what my colleague said. We have to figure out a way as Americans to trust one another, trust that we can, we can, we can uh, be mining these natural resources or we can be uh, utilizing these natural resources in ways that will uh, amplify whether it's Department of Defense or the green energy platform, whatever it is. But I think we can all agree that we do want a safe environment. We do want clean air. We do want to do what's right for our, for our country. But I think that we sometimes move away from the one thing I think we can all agree on. We want to live in a nation that is very safe. And I think being uh, reliant on adversarial nations for some of these elements and these natural resources we have here is putting ourselves in a more compromising position. So I agree. I hope that we will. Uh, get this resolution passed. I think we do deserve to have for the American people the uh, information that will help us make a good decision, but we can't discount the the importance of the Department of Defense piece. And I can assure you we are way behind the eight ball when it comes to national defense and weaponry and infrastructure uh, when it comes to our military operations. And so we at least owe the conversation to go a little bit that direction so that we can stand strong with our American uh, soldiers, our service members, and our um, our entire platform in terms of national safety. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and with that, I yield back. General Lady Yields, anyone else? Sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, it's always interesting to me to, to hear these discussions and, and to note uh, the, the, the arguments that um, that are so obvious, and I'm going to I'm going to repeat a bunch that we've already heard. But uh, why? Because I think it's so important to the future of our country. The net zero goals for carbon will double the demand for copper by 2035. That's a mere 12 years from now. I repeat it: the net zero goals will double the demand for copper. Uh, electric vehicles use twice as much copper as a gas-powered car. There's 400 pounds of copper in a new home. Uh, if the world's going to be electrified, it's going to take twice as much copper as we're currently producing. The current downturn in the copper price is causing an underinvestment in the production of copper worldwide. There just was a, 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 a huge plant in Peru canceled by virtue of the low price current of copper, which means in three to four years, the price will be even higher unless we think ahead and actually do something. Uh, we hear again and again and again how that which we do in the United States is, is uh, affecting the world when it comes to carbon creation, but we don't say a word about the damage that's being done to the environment in China as they uh, extract more and more uh, earth that has a lower and lower productive capacity for copper. And what that means is that the, that the environment in that country, at least, and others, is being sacrificed up for our desire to have this uh, or achieve this net zero goal. It's astounding to me there many people would say if we had actually developed copper here in the United States, we would export it. That's hardly the point. 
The point is that we would have copper here in the United States. It's great that we can export it and make money from it, but it's even greater that we actually have that absolutely essential resource available within the United States, and we don't have to worry about importing it from other countries and, and see the, the really sad picture again of our president going to another country and begging for, in the previous case, oil, or the current case, oil, but in the future, copper. Of course, I support the uh, issue before us today, and uh, I yield back. Anyone else wish to be recognized? Mr. Chairman? Sir? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I came to, to listen um, to the, um, the various reasons why we should entertain this resolution. And um, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. You know, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I just, I just reflect on my time here in the Congress, and I reflect back to my time in the 116th when um, my colleagues were trying to move similar resolutions uh, under a Republican president to, uh, to get information from a Republican administration. And uh, those efforts were receiving uh, an entirely different um, uh, argument from the other side of the aisle. Uh, so many um, back and forths over whether or not uh, information should be um, pursued uh, from a Republican administration. And, um, and the arguments were being made on this side of the aisle. You know, we need the transparency. We need to be able to look at what's going on. We need to be able to make the decisions uh, based on, on what we're able to uncover. Uh, and the resistance was um, was uh, basically of an opposite tenor from what we're hearing hearing today, and and then I and then I listened more more distinctly to some comments about about the decline of America, and um, and those comments were kind of focused on how the decline of America is um, is occurring as a result of us losing our preeminence in certain areas, but I I really think the de the decline of America. Is, is actually that kind of partisanship, you know, where one minute, depending on which administration's in power, we're going to oppose um, releasing information, and the next minute, depending on which administration's in power, we're going to encourage the releasing of information. I think that kind of partisanship, the partisanship that tries to make January 6th um, something else, or the kind of partisanship that, that makes us not supporting Ukraine something that we should all of a sudden start entertaining, we should support Ukraine, and we should, consider January 6th to be an absolute travesty. That shouldn't be a partisan argument. Any more than seeking information shouldn't be a partisan argument. I feel like the information we were seeking in the 116th should have been as equally supported as the information that's being sought today. I am inclined to support this resolution, but I would do so in the appeal that we learn to cool the partisanship. We learn to cool the partisanship and if it requires us to learn to bend, and if, and if I need to vote to support this resolution as, as, a, as, a, as a move towards that kind of bending, then I think that that's what we all need to, to reflect on because it's that kind of partisanship that's really going to bring down this country. So I would like to appeal to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that if there are those of us who are going to be open to supporting this, let's be consistent about it. Let's be consistent about it when this side of the aisle is also going to be seeking information regardless of which administration is in power. And let's be mindful of the fact that there are certain things that we, we do need to have information on and we do need to be supportive of, uh, whether it's the need for us to really engage in responsible mining to support our um, clean energy initiatives, or the need for us to be um, very upfront about how devastating January 6 really was and how important it is for, for us to actually go out there and support Ukraine. You know, let's, let's, let's start doing those kind of things. I think that's what the American people want us to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Chairman Yields, anyone else? <coughs> Mr. Westerman, anyone else? I don't think we have any more. Yeah. And, uh, and I appreciate all the comments. And, and, and I uh, recognize myself. Um, you know, I, I oppose the, this resolution of inquiry. And I do so, um, and I have all the list of things that I, I would read to you about. But we, we've been through this in two hearings. I've made these statements time and time again. And we've had the back and forth on the legislation time and time again. So I'm not going to. 
I'm not going to go into that part of it. I just want, I just think that, uh, that one area is that I, that, that in a rush to send, it was part of a strategy to, to, to message this resolution and the other ones that happened before that. And I hope the urgency of that in the, mom, in the heat of the moment isn't as vital as, as some people want to make it out to be. I don't think it is anyway. But the issue is that uh, uh, we're here to talk about that. And, and I just want to use this opportunity uh, to also talk about uh, the anticipated transition uh, on this committee and, and in, in the House of Representatives uh, and, uh, and the backdrop uh, to that transition that I think all of us need to be, in the words of my friend, mindful. Uh, the red wave tsunami that was to sweep, sweep this Congress clean, as a matter of speaking, uh, actually turned into one of those backyard slip and slides that you used to play on when you were a kid, you know, you just didn't, didn't have the ump. And so we're in a transition where we are uh, narrowly divided. And in our side, uh, I think feels very strongly that the backdrop of, uh, you know, we have an announcement for president just today, yesterday, uh, and uh, the majority will increase with the Georgia runoff uh, for Democrats in the Senate. And I would hope that my Republican colleagues, uh, if they do become the majority in the House, uh, that the actions and tones of this last resolution and the ones prior to that don't become the, uh, the MO for the operation of the committee. I think there is focus points that we, are, we, would, we would seek to seek agreement with you. And there are those in which uh, we feel very strongly, we'll continue to feel very strongly about. And, and those are, are, are surrounded with the fundamental issue of uh, the environment, climate, and, and the balance that has to be reached. It's not either or, there's a balance. And uh, we, we're, we're not afraid to work with you on that balance question, but it is uh, an equitable uh, discussion about priorities. Uh, and uh, that's our commitment, uh, but it's also our commitment to uh, defend uh, the greater interests of the American people and that's to protect them from the worst effects uh, of climate, economically, health-wise, et cetera. Those will continue to be our focus in all discussions. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to call the, uh, without, without, without objection, the ANS offered by myself is considered to be as read and open to amendment at any time. Any amendments? If there are no amendments, the question is on adopting the ANS. I will pause so, so the members join remotely can unmute. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, indicate by saying no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the INS is adopted. The motion to reconsider is uh, laid on the table. Mr. Chairman, under committee rule 5C, I give notice of my intention to file additional or dissenting views on the bill just considered and all bills considered during this markup and ask unanimous consent that this notice be extended to all members. Without objection. Uh, the question is now on adopting the resolution as amended and, and it reported and reported unfavorably to the House. All those in favor of the Motion indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and I, uh, and, and the resolution is adopted as amended, order unfavorably reported. The motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Westerman, uh, having requested a recorded vote, uh, <laughs> the clerk will please call the roll. Mr. Grijalva.
Aye. Mr. Wialba votes aye. Mr. Westerman? No. Mr. Westerman votes no. Mrs. Napolitano? Aye. Mrs. Napolitano votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Costa? Mr. Costa votes aye. Mr. Costa votes aye. Mr. Lamborn? No. Mr. Lamborn votes no. Mr. Sablon? Sablon votes aye. Mr. Sablon votes aye. Mr. Whitman? Whitman votes no. Mr. Whitman votes no. Mr. Huffman? Mr. McClintock? No. Mr. McClintock, I don't have a visual. Yes, Mr. McClintock have... votes no. Uh, Mr. No. Lowenthal? Mr. Lowenthal votes aye. Mr. Lowenthal votes aye. Mr. Graves? No. Mr. Graves votes no. Mr. Gallego? He'll get to me in a minute. Mr. Heiss? Heiss, no. Mr. Heiss votes no. Mr. Negus? Oh, no, it's okay. Mr. Negus? Uh, Mr. Negus votes aye. Mrs. Radawagon. Mr. Uh, Mrs. Radawagon votes no. Mr. Levin. Aye. Mr. Levin votes aye. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster votes no. Ms. Porter. Porter votes aye. Ms. Porter votes aye. Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Gonzalez Colon votes no. Ms. Gonzalez Colon votes no. Ms. Leje Fernandez. Ms. Leger Fernandez votes aye. Mr. Falter? Falter's no. Mr. Falter votes no. Ms. Stansberry? Aye. Ms. Stansberry votes aye. Mr. Stauber? No. Mr. Stauber votes no. Mrs. Peltola? Yes. Mrs. Peltola votes aye. Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany votes no. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Ms. Velasquez? Velasquez votes no. Ms. Velasquez votes no. Mr. Carl? No. Mr. Carl. Mr. Carl votes no. Ms. DeGette? DeGette votes aye. Ms. DeGette votes aye. Mr. Rosendale? Ms. Brownlee? Ms. Brownlee votes aye. Ms. Brownlee votes aye. Mr. Moore? No. Ms. Mr. Moore votes no. Mrs. Dingle? Votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Ms. Harrell? Ms. Harrell votes no. Mr. McEachin? McEachin votes yes. Mr. McEachin votes aye. Mrs. Oh, Bobert? Bobert votes no. Mrs. Bobert votes no. Mr. Soto? Soto votes aye. Mr. Soto votes aye. Mr. Obernolte? Mr. Obernolte votes no. Mr. Sam Nicholas? No. Mr. Sam Nicholas votes no. Mr. Bentz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Garcia? Garcia votes aye. Mr. Garcia votes aye. Ms. Conway? Ms. Conway votes no. Ms. Conway votes no. Mr. Case? I'm going to walk with me. Ms. McCollum? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Tonko? Mr. Tonko votes aye. Ms. Tlaib? Tlaib votes no. Ms. Tlaib yeah. votes no. Yes, Tlaib votes no. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Tlaib votes aye. I apologize. Ms. Tlaib votes aye. What were we asking? Back. Thank you. If the clerk would please uh, read the names yes, of the uh, members not Adam, recorded. Uh, Gomert, Gomert uh, votes no. Mr. Gomert votes no. Madam Claire, how Ms. Velasquez is recorded? How is Ms. Velasquez recorded? 
Ms. Velasquez is recorded as a no. No. It's a yes. Ms. Velasquez votes aye. Mr. Huffman? Mr. Gallego? Mr. Rosendale? This internal rule in the hotel, not Western Bear Bob. Mr. Mr. Case, Mr. Huffman. Mr. Huffman is not recorded. Mr. Huffman votes aye. Are there members who uh, wish to vote or to change their vote? Um, can, the, can the Mr. Chair? Please, yes. the clerk, uh, can you report who's not recorded? Uh, Mr. Gallego, Mr. Rosendale, Mr. Case and Ms. McCollum. Thank you. Are there uh, any other me members that wish to vote? Of those mentioned that are, haven't voted, they're not recorded. If not, the vote is closed. And uh, clerk will please report. Mr. Chair, on, on this vote, the yeas are 22 and the nays are 21. The A's have it, and the resolution is adopted as amended and ordered unfavorably reported. The motion to reconsider is laid on the table. And every, uh, any, uh, without objection, uh, I will, all members shall have two days in which to uh, sub file supplemental additional minority or dissenting views, of which I can't think too many more should can be added. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be allowed to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the measures ordered reported today with the uh, approval of the minority. Uh, unanimous consent that for any measure ordered reported today with amendments that the bill be considered reported with an amendment to strike out all after the enacting clause and insert the text of the bill with the perfecting amendments uh, adopted in committee and that's been ordered. Um, with that, no further business before the committee and we're adjourned. Thank you.